Hey everyone, Darwin from GitLab here. I wanted to walk you through some enhancements that have been made to the GitLab uh, HA scaling runner vending machine for AWS. Basically, there was some desire on the part of GitLab teams and uh, folks at Amazon to make this a little bit easier, especially for those of you who do not need to do infrastructure as code for any other reason. So for GitLab, a primary target would be if someone is using gitlab.com uh, SAS and they are using the shared runners there, but then they realize they need to use uh, private runners for a ver variety of reasons. There's a, a whole lot of reasons why you might need to use private runners. Some of these teams are small and they don't have infrastructure as code specialists available to them. And so it can be challenging to then dive into the runner documentation to understand how to manually start building automation to build this. So previously, the, the CloudFormation template allowed you to load it up in the console and has about 20 some parameters. However, if you just have a simple scenario, you might not need all 20 parameters. So this allows some parent CloudFormation templates to be put in front of that and to simplify the parameters around specific use cases. So if you have a simple situation where you just want Docker Linux runner capability and you want it to be hot HA, which means we would put two of them, into a ASG and uh, you don't need scaling, well then you don't turn on the scaling part and have to tune that and pay attention to it. You simply let it run and if one of them dies, the other one will, will respawn and reestablish itself. So let's take a look. Uh, basically what this is gonna let you do is use a very graphical experience in order to uh, work with the GitLab runner. This is kind of an announcement that explains the benefits of doing it this way. In addition, for those of you who are advanced users, you don't have to think of this project as just for basic UI-oriented operations. It's full infrastructure as code. You could have a very advanced idea of how GitLab scaling runners should work for you, and you can use this code at least as a starting point, if not as your actual way to, to deploy this capability. One interesting thing here too to keep in mind is that these scenarios can be put into AWS Service Catalog. So each of the CloudFormation templates that are uh, parent templates to simplify things could be put in AWS Service Catalog. Not only that, it's really easy to take a look at them and build your own. So if you have a scenario that you want to prime the pump and make it super easy for teams or individuals at your organization to set up, set up a GitLab HA runner, then you can easily just look at what code's there and, and extend it. So let's take a look at what this looks like. I'm going to go to the root of our repository, which will expose my readme. And the documentation has also been reorganized. A couple things that have been moved, the features, there's a lot of really cool features, and these are just the categories of the features of this template listed here. But it, the features have been moved out to a features uh, document so that they don't clutter the readme experience. The easy buttons have been put up front. Previously, they were code, so they required you to have the AWS CLI installed and configured to work properly. And then to grab this really long command line and drop it in there and substitute a couple parameters. So still not a really super smooth experience if you would just prefer to do this in a UI. That capability has not gone away, it's still there and it's documented lower in this document, but the new capability is the ability to simply push these buttons and load CloudFormation templates right from this project into the console. So let's take this simple example here, Docker 2 example, simple hot HA, going to click it. If I'm not already logged into Amazon, it's going to prompt me to log into Amazon. So I will do that now. Uh, let me find the right account here. And now I'm inside of this simplified stack. You can see that it already primed a name for me. Be careful of using too long of names because we use this in the bucket name. So if the bucket, the resultant bucket name goes over 63 characters, you will get a failure. Um, the other thing is it defaults to the GitLab uh, instance, and you can of course change that to any instance you wish. And then I'm going to quickly find um, a runner token. And I will be, well, actually it doesn't matter anymore. So I'm gonna put my runner token right in here and you don't see it because we have the no mask uh, turned on for that parameter. This is optional tags. So you can tell GitLab what tags, additional tags you'd like to see in the runner. 
All runner tags also go in as AWS tags as well, not individual tags, but just one big uh, list of tags uh, as in AWS tags so that you can kind of map things together. In addition, um, you can pick your instance type. I would caution you on using um, bursty instance types for anything in production. I always do this for folks because I've seen individuals rework automation code and even application code to get around weird timing and error conditions that only happen on bursty instances. Um, so you might be able to get away with running on a T2 or a T3 for your runner. And if you can, that's great. But if you start to see any oddities, uh, that would be the first thing I would think about changing. All I have to do now is click these two. So if you're on gitlab.com, you literally just pasted in a runner token or runner token list. If you use a list, use semicolons to separate. Also, uh, in the documentation, it discusses that runner tokens exist at the instance level if you have a private instance of GitLab. They exist at the group levels, all every group level in your organization hierarchy, and at the project level. Whatever token or tokens you pick and insert here will attach the runner at that level at Git, in GitLab, and it will be available to all projects in the downbound hierarchy. So just keep that in mind. I'm going to hit Create Stack now. And what's going to happen is AWS is going to start to create this template. Now, it's going to create uh, the template from uh, a sub-template. So that initial template that we fired off is simply to abstract a bunch of command line parameters that maybe you don't want to have to think about if you just need this simple scenario. And so it's starting the runner ASG uh, sub template uh, in order to actually launch this. So what I'll do is probably press the pause video button and have you rejoin uh, once this is completed running. All right, this is finished up now. And one thing I wanted to show you was this starts a child CloudFormation stack. And so it can be confusing that there's not a lot of status updates coming into this initial stack if you're experienced with CloudFormation. So you want to look for the child stack. You can find out where the child stack is either by looking at the similar name over here on the left, or if you go into resources, it will provide you a direct link to that stack. And when we go look at this stack, we can now see that we have things that created successfully. So if we had any failures, we could start digging into this sub stack and finding out what exactly happened. One common reason for failure would be you created too long of a name for the ASG, which created too long of a name for the bucket and the bucket creation fails and everything else fails. So just keep that in mind. Also, if you need to delete and restart, you can just hit delete on the parent stack. It's usually preferable to uh, delete on the parent stack. So now let's take a quick look at how this plays out inside of GitLab. I'm going to bring up the exact GitLab group that we registered to, which is a private group and has no repository code in it. It just has test uh, GitLab CI test code to do stuff like generate artifacts to make sure the artifact cache is working, et cetera. Um, so if I go to runners here, we actually created these bottom two right here. Now notice the tagging. Uh, it tells you the hardware architecture, and that is because we also, for Linux, support ARM. So we support ARM64 if you specify it for Linux. The compute type. So it's telling me this is an on-demand instance, which means that it is not spot. And we can also support spot with these templates and even with the uh, easy buttons. So when that happens, if a specific instance is spot compute, it'll say compute type spot. And then your workload uh, can be sent routed there or not routed there based on that tag. So you can decide that you're going to uh, explicitly run something on demand or on spot uh, by controlling the tags for a given job. We also tell you the GitLab executor type. So you can see here it's Docker and the operating system is Linux. So this also supports Windows. So we could also be doing shell on Windows or Linux. On, uh, so all the different kinds of combos will kind of self-publish what they're running so that you know what workloads they can take. Uh, just note that when you use the Linux Docker executor, it will take untagged jobs. And that's because that's what happens on GitLab.com. Every other executor type will require that you specify tags. So if you're doing a Linux shell runner or any Windows runner, you have to specify the full set of tags to route to that runner uh, in your job. And that's simply to make sure that it behaves kind of like .com. So the default idea is any job can be picked up by a Linux Docker runner. And if you need to do specialty other operations, you have to add some tags to your job. Let's take a look at the runners in AWS. 
So let's say that you're using this template to allow a lot of teams to come in and deploy GitLab runners. So the individual teams don't need to know infrastructure's code, and they don't even really need to know a lot of details other than their, their Amazon credentials. Also note that I logged into the console with my Amazon credentials and launched the template in there, and that's what allowed me to uh, drop this code into a specific Amazon account. One thing I didn't point out too was back here when we did do the CloudFormation uh, launch, uh, let me just launch another one to check that link. Uh, it'll launch in a given region. Uh, you can go ahead and select the region at this point to redirect it to a different region. So keep that in mind. You need to do that at the initial launch point in order to select uh, your region. So now let's take a look at the instances, which we'll find in um, EC2. And when we take a look here, uh, I was mentioning that you may be an enablement team that is letting your, your uh, end customers within your internal organization deploy runners. And at a certain point, someone's going to say, hey, this runner's not working right. And you're going to wonder if it's an AWS side problem. And then uh, starts the rabbit holes of trying to figure out where exactly in Amazon is this runner. Uh, I worked at one organization that had over a thousand AWS accounts and we were pointing at one GitLab instance, but you might have many, many AWS accounts and multiple GitLab instances. And so all of a sudden you have this quandary of where is this runner machine? So what this template does is create some tagging to make that identification more quick. So if I click on these, now I happen to know they're in this region and in this account. Um, but if I am running any kind of inventory anywhere in the organization, we have tags that start to tell you what's going on with the runner bits. So here's the GitLab runner tags that were used on this inside and what, what we should see in the console, which we did. Here's the compute type also gets flagged at this level, which is not a natural Amazon thing to do. But here the GitLab runner name is um, the instance name in the account name in the region. And so if we go back to GitLab, we can observe that. Um, right here, instance ID in account number in region. So we just make the name, kind of overload the name so that you can find it. Uh, the reason why you wouldn't use tags for that information is if the runner requires tags, then it's gonna require those tags. And people are gonna ask you, why am I required to enter the tag US East one? I don't care where the runner is. So that's why the name is kind of overloaded with that data uh, in order to allow quick uh, correlation between the two. That's about it for um, the uh, for helping you understand how these work. There are a bunch of pre-built scenarios here. Um, there are four or five for Amazon Linux 2, including one for ARM. Uh, then there are four for uh, Windows 1903 build. Note that on all of these that do scaling, the scaling is not particularly tuned to anything. It's just an example of scaling. So I believe I did scale on CPU with usage of 70% across the age ASG will trigger scale up and usage of 20 or 40% will scale down and it will use step scaling, which means that if you're under a sudden burst of activity, it won't wait till you know the first one it spins up is done to start spinning up more. If you have a specialty runner, the workloads may look different. If you have a lot of containers that are pulling something for status, they're not gonna use very much CPU, but they will use memory. The template under the covers does support using memory as well in order to do uh, scaling uh, up and down, which might be more appropriate for Docker machine uh, runners. So as soon as you get into scaling, uh, a little bit of SRE skills, both in terms of what your runner workloads look like and how you might scale them is important. You should know that we turn on CloudWatch metrics for both operating systems and load the uh, memory is uploaded into CloudWatch metrics as well as disk IO, as well as uh, disk space and other things so that you can potentially, if you're having problems, go in and see, oh, you know, even though we're scaling on memory, the network IO of these instances is not sufficient. So let's pick a different instance type. So even if you're not if you're manually scaling, you can still go in and look at those metrics and decide, oh, let's pick a different instance type, or let's have five now, if you prefer to do manual scaling versus auto scaling. So just keep that in mind. The built-in auto scaling scenarios are just for 
demonstration purposes, we're going to work to try to see if we can track more scenarios for scaling and get feedback from customers into this project and find out what people are using for scaling that works well, say for a very generic load in runners. But quite frankly, there's no specific machine metric that is predictive of your load. On gitlab.com, we do um, use uh, uh, job queues lengths, but those are not really, those will cause you to be very responsive, but potentially overscale in order to be responsive. And so there's a variety of ways to scale. I just wanted to note that in today's easy button demonstration, we were using a default VPC in Amazon and going out to gitlab.com. That means that I automatically had the ability to reach out to the internet from within my VPC and that DNS and network routing were all working just fine to my GitLab instance. If you have a more restricted scenario in terms of the VPC or the GitLab instance, then you'd have to make sure that those paths are clear and open, including uh, firewalling. One really cool thing about GitLab Runner is it does lightweight polling only. So you only need to be able to reach out from the runner on port 443 to the GitLab instance and then be allowed to have return conversations. So that's the good news as far as network connectivity goes. We'll have more information in the future on how to service more restricted scenarios. So I hope that this new uh, UI-oriented capability to quickly get runners running on Amazon will be helpful to uh, everyone out there, our customers, um, our channel partners, and our internal uh, organizations. Thanks a lot.